Shortly after the release of Adobe Captivate 8, I produced a video tutorial on publishing your e-learning project for use with a learning management system. Uh, it's been a few years since that tutorial, and judging by some of the questions and comments that I've seen on my YouTube channel about that process, I thought it was time that we revisit that. So I've got my little project here uh, in Adobe Captivate 2017. And there's a lot of little checks and things that, uh, that I used to recommend in that previous video. But I'll show you some shortcuts to get to those items uh, today. So I'm going to use the published, uh, Publish icon in the toolbar. Now you'll notice that there are four options. We're going to focus on the first one, Publish for Devices. And what it means by Publish for Devices, uh, computers, tablets, smartphones, all that stuff and for a learning management system. So if you happen to be using Typekit fonts in your project, you may see this message before you arrive at the publish window. This is just a reminder that uh, Captivate lets you design with Typekit uh, fonts only, but publishes with Typekit web fonts. This means that uh, there may be some minor uh, layout differences between your design and published project, but also it's just a reminder that this will be linked to your account. Uh, so if you're publishing this for another organization, you may wish to log in with their Typekit account ID uh, to ensure that the Typekit fonts are associated with their account because uh, you wouldn't want to discontinue your account and suddenly uh, put people, uh, put other organizations out by suddenly having their fonts disappear on them. Uh, but assuming that everything is okay, we'll go to the Publish for Devices window. Uh, and here you'll see HTML5. That's the only option because this particular project is a responsive design project. So I can put in the title of my project here. Uh, there's a default choice for the location of where you publish your files. Uh, the only thing I recommend, you can place this anywhere. I've chosen my desktop, but the only thing I recommend is that you make sure it's a local drive. Uh, check off zip files if it isn't already che uh, checked off. You may wish to add additional files to your e-learning package, so you can choose to leave it unzipped and then zip it yourself later. Uh, but in this case, that's not what I'm going to be doing, so I'll leave that checked off as zip. Uh, and again, because this is associated with my, uh, my Typekit account, I need to supply up to 10 domain names for the, uh, the Typekit fonts to work properly uh, because I'm going to be publishing this project to my Amazon AWS server. All I need to enter is star.amazonaws.com and that'll work fine. So there's some nice links here, actually. First of all, this is designed to confirm that you've set up everything correctly. But if you need to change something, these links will open up additional windows, allowing you to make further revisions before you actually hit the Publish button. So let's go through a few of those things here. Uh, information like there's six slides in this particular project. None of them contain any audio, but if they did, I could go into my audio settings and customize those, uh, you know, whatever bit rate I wish to choose or uh, so on and so forth. Uh, display score is yes. Of course, if I click that, that's going to open up the preferences window specifically to the subcategory of settings under the quiz category. And here, of course, I could uh, show score at the end of the quiz. And I could even customize uh, my messages, my pass message, my fail message, and choose which items I'm going to display on the quiz results slide. In this particular example, I'm using a custom quiz results slide, so I've actually unchecked all of these. Uh, I can click OK and return back to the Publish for Devices window. Uh, mobile gestures are not currently turned on, but if you wish to turn on mobile gestures, you can do so. Doing so will allow users to access a job aid that essentially looks like this from right within their, their web browser and learn about how they can swipe right or left to navigate the course. They can pinch to zoom. They can uh, double tap to show the table of contents. And they can swipe up and down 
to show or hide the play bar and things like that. So let's click OK. Uh, if your course used geolocation, uh, that actually opens up the same window. And you'll see this option down here for geolocation. And uh, when geolocation changes, you can specify which advanced answer script gets run uh, to customize your e-learning however you see fit. Accessibility should be turned on uh, whenever possible. If you click on that, again, it will open up your preferences window, but open it up specifically to the publish settings under your project. And uh, you can make sure, of course, that enable accessibility is checked off. Obviously, there are other things that you need to do with your e-learning course to make sure that it's truly 508 compliant. Um, but the first step, of course, would be to make sure that accessibility is turned on. Uh, while it's not specifically drawing uh, your attention to this, this link also brings you to this page where you can disallow phone landscape orientation. And what that refers to is when I design a responsive design e-learning course that's going to be used on a smartphone, I always design it to be in portrait mode. That's going to be my focus. So what I can do is when a user turns their phone this way, I can display a message across the screen and you can customize that message here. And uh, the default is to turn your device to portrait mode to see this course. You can customize that or change it to what, say whatever you need it to say. We'll click on OK. And uh, that brings us to the final step, which is preparing for the type of e-learning output that you're going to use. So let's click on that. It's currently disabled. And this will bring you to the Preferences window to the subcategory of Reporting underneath the Quiz category. So the first thing you need to do is check off that you wish to enable reporting for this project. And this will allow you to make further selections. The first option is that you can choose some of the standard LMSs that are available. Moodle, you can use an internal server with your corporation. Uh, you can choose other standard LMSs, which is probably going to be the most common. Uh, Adobe Connect, if you're using that and question mark perception if you're using that. For today, we'll just stick with other standard LMSs. The next thing to talk about is which e-learning standard you're going to choose. Usually you would need to partner with someone who's an expert within your organization uh, as to which LMS you have and what its capabilities are. But there are four choices that can be selected here. The first is SCORM 1.2, and probably the most common. The next is SCORM 2004. Uh, SCORM 2004 is a newer version of SCORM, and it offers some additional capabilities, which I'll touch on in this video as well. Also, you have AICC, which stands for the Aviation Industry Computer-Based Training Committee. Uh, the final choice is XAPI. Uh, or Experience API, also known as Tin Can. In the case of SCORM 1.2, SCORM 2004, and XAPI, you can actually configure what's known as a manifest file. This gets included with your e-learning project, and when your e-learning project is uploaded to the learning management system, the learning management system can use information found in that manifest file to pre-populate a lot of fields within the learning management system. So we're going to stick with SCORM 1.2 because, again, that's probably still the most common. Now, the next section deals with, of course, uh, two things which are really the same thing in SCORM 1, 1.2, and that's status representation and success completion criteria. Status representation refers to what the status of a user's completion of a particular e-learning course is. As soon as they launch their e-learning courses, uh, they start off as being incomplete. Once they complete the course, then they could be represented as complete, or depending on the success completion criteria, they can be passed or failed, depending on which circumstance has occurred. I generally 
choose the latter. I choose incomplete versus passed or failed because for me, more often than not, completing a course is successfully passing a quiz. But there are other combinations you could choose. Uh, the success completion criteria can be anything. It can be simply accessing the course. So if we wanted people to simply watch a video, for example, and there was no quiz at the end of the video, you could just allow users to complete their course or pass their course uh, by launching that course and watching the video. Uh, this is not a very effective way of measuring whether someone is capable of performing some new skill or knowledge back on the job. So usually you're going to choose slide views and or quiz. And you can do a combination of slide views or quiz. Uh, in the case of slide views, you can say if the user has looked at 100% of all the slides, then they will be considered successful or complete. Or you could get more specific and say X number of slides need to be viewed uh, to completion for this to be successful or complete. Again, more often than not, people are going to simply choose quiz as passed. Now, if you choose the status representation of incomplete or complete, you actually get a few more choices under quiz. You can specify that the quiz has to be passed. It has to be attempted, uh, or you can say it has to be passed or the quiz attempt limit has been reached. Again, more often than not, incomplete, passed, failed, quizzes passed is probably your best choice for having effective evaluations at the end of your e-learning course. So you can report um, the percentage or the, the quiz score as a percentage or as a number of points. I've never had any problem with percentage except for one instance where the percentage rounding rules were different with the learning management system versus Adobe Captivate, in which case switching to points became more effective and allowed us to report more accurately. You can also choose to submit interaction data. Interaction data is information not only about what score was achieved, but what answers were selected throughout the quiz. Um, you know, they chose answer A or answer C. Um, and uh, even more specifically, like fill in the blank, what the users actually typed in and, and so on. Uh, LMS initialization text, uh, usually just loading is, is filled out here, and I leave it that way. Uh, under advanced, there's a few options here. You may wish to select send data on every slide, and this will ensure that the LMS will have as much information as possible when there's a connection switch from, say, Wi-Fi to hard connection or uh, from Wi-Fi to mobile data, things of that nature. By default, your e-learning course in Adobe Captivate uh, will have bookmarking enabled. So in other words, if a user uh, completes half of the course today and wants to return and complete the second half tomorrow, they will be able to do that. If for some reason you wish to not allow them to bookmark, in other words, you want them to complete the course in one shot, you can check never send resume data. And this will ensure that bookmarking is turned off. The escape version and session ID, uh, when this is checked off, this gets converted into the URL encoded uh, equivalent of that. And you can also specify which escape characters are not included in that escape version and session ID. I always leave this checked. I don't uncheck it and I don't enter in anything here. I've never had a problem with it, uh, so I've always stuck with those particular settings. Once you've done that, you are pretty much good to go. So we're going to click OK at this point, and we're going to uh, start the publish process. So again, you know, make sure everything is set up the way that you wish. And once you've got everything working and tested with previews and so forth and so on, you're ready to publish. And as you'll see, 
It's a very simple process. We hit publish. If you've published before, it's going to give you this uh, warning message. The file already exists. Do you wish to overwrite? Uh, you can check off don't ask me again, or you can just click on yes, and it will start to generate the slides and package everything together. If you thought this video was useful, please share it with your colleagues. If you need help with your next e-learning project, consider hiring me. My focus is to create effective e-learning that helps you achieve your business goals. Visit my website at CaptivateTeacher.com, follow me on Twitter at PaulWilsonLD, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.